All right, they said, ow. Okay, they said, ow. Hey, it is fantastic to be with you this morning. It is an honor and a privilege to open the word of the Lord. And with that being said, would you stand to your feet as we read from God's word? Our text this morning is going to be 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17. You know, however, about all my teachings, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and posturers go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and be become, have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord Jesus, even today as we go through this message, Father, as we begin this series learning how to understand your word, I ask that you would help my words to be clear, all of our hearts to be opened, that, Lord, we would see you hear you, and follow you in these days. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I have the privilege of starting our uh, next series. Uh, We're calling it the Holy Bible. And uh, the reason for it is that how many people, out of curiosity, have ever read a devotional of any kind? Awesome. Great. How many of you read devotionals on a regular basis? Fantastic. Okay. How many of you, when you were reading devotionals, wondered, wow, how did this person understand all of this? Like, how many of you have ever thought, man, I wish I could be that insightful? Well, I want to let you know that God's word was not just meant for a couple of writers and a couple of preachers on the platform. God gave us his word because he desires so deeply to reveal himself to each one of you. But the problem is so many times we approach reading the Bible with mindsets that are off. Sometimes we, we approach it with a sense of, well, I know I should read the Bible, so I open the Bible and I read a scripture. Okay, that was nice, done, I did my thing for the day. Others, the only scripture you're going to read is whatever the devotional is there. And listen, I'm not going to knock devotions. I think it's a great place to start. But if that's where you stay, then you're missing something. And I hope by the end of today, or at least by the end of our series, we'll have moved the needle. My goal is for you to understand that God gave us this not as a piece of literature alone, although you would technically be looked at as literature, and there's lots of different types of literature within the Bible. But God gave this as more than just a book of rules to follow. He gave this to us as a way of revealing himself to us. But the interesting thing is, I find that so many people don't understand this because all they ever do is just read this. I don't want to change our mindsets and begin to change it a little bit. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I was trying to do the math, and I think a statute of limitations has run out. So pastoral confession. You all ready? You all come to me for confession. Now I'm coming to you for confession. So about 19 years ago, um, I had an opportunity as pastor here to help. We were helping another church that was going through some struggles. And uh, in that process, uh, you know, Bishop said, hey, listen, I want you to kind of 
oversee that church as we're kind of helping them figure out direction. And, uh, and so great, great challenge, you know, like junior, senior pastor, you know, and uh, went in with all kinds of high expectations. Boy, I'm going to help them and I'm going to use all my pastoral, you know, uh, care gifts for those because there's some pain going on and whatever. And, and so, you know, I had some wonderful relationships and some of those people are still here. They're wonderful and I could look at them and I am looking at some of them and, and just the joy. I have, but I remember this situation. I had one individual who, no matter what I did, they had a comment, they had a complaint, they had a question. It was, well, we don't do it that way. That's not how we do it. Or, Pastor Mike, I don't know if I agree with you about the scripture. And, Pastor Mike, how come this? And, how come not that? And, why are you this? And, why are you not that? And, I remember just being, you know, loving and caring and inside I'm like getting more and more tired. Well, I got to a point where I was just, I was so done. So I remember the last email that I got from this gentleman listing his latest questions and complaints. And we had another pastor who was with us at the time who was kind of transitioning to uh, help out with that church. And I remember thinking, you know what? I'm going to help this transition happen a little faster, and I'm just going to forward this email over to that pastor. And so I did that. I forwarded over to him with my commentary on it. And my commentary was, hey, pastor, um, I'm really tired of these emails and questions. I've done everything I know how to do, but I'm kind of done. I really don't have time for babies. Would you be willing to just take this one over and maybe you can move the needle a little? And I waited for a reply. Day went by, I didn't hear from that pastor. Another day went by, and I didn't hear from that pastor. And another day went by, and so finally, the next Sunday when I saw the pastor, I was like, hey, you know, I, I sent you that email. I never heard back from you. Did you just, you know, step into it or whatever? And what do you think his words were? What email? Sure enough, I go back, and I didn't hit forward. I hit yes. Oh. Like I said, that was the last email I ever had from that gentleman. My words that he read that were not directed towards him did not really reflect who I am as an individual as much as they reflected the frustration of the moment that I was in. But at the same time, it reveals something about my nature. I have limitations. I only have so far that I can go before I'm done. Now, here's the interesting thing. I have grown tremendously. My wife keeps telling me, and I think she's lying to me, but maybe she's just doing it. She says, you are the most patient man I know. I say, well, honey, if you really knew what was going on inside, with you know, but she still thinks I'm patient. Thank you, honey. I appreciate it. But the reality of it is, is these words so often reveal our character inside, but they don't always reveal everything. Because you can read a letter like that, but if you came back and actually had a conversation with me, you would find out that I would have quickly, I was mortified at what I'd done. I instantly stopped looking at him. I looked at myself. I realized I was the one in sin. And if we had had an opportunity, maybe there could have been a restoration of relationship. And he would have seen the character and nature of who I am, not just by the flaws of the words I put on the page, but by who I am in reality. But see, here's the crazy, crazy thing. God gave us this word, and you know, this Bible, there's some hard things to hear in this Bible. There's some things in here that'll smack you up the side of the face if all you ever do is just read it, but you don't get to know the author behind it. And what I want you to understand is this. While I'm imperfect, and I may mess up in writing, if you get to know me, I'm accountable, and I'll, I'll do my best to change. I'll, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be as humble as I know how to be. But God's word has never changed. It's always been perfect, 
It's always relevant, and it's not just for preachers and devotional writers. It's for you. But what you have to understand is this. It's kind of like a circular reasoning thing, right? Because knowing the author helps you understand the message. But also, reading the message helps you understand the author. So what I want to do, and what we want to do over the next few weeks, is not leave us in this place of saying, well, what you just have to do is read the Bible. Because there's a lot of people that have scholarly degrees, masters and doctorates in the text of the Bible who have no relationship with God. And they can debate the context, they can debate the way it's put together, but all of it without any relationship with the one who actually wrote it. And because of that, they use it to bolster their own opinions rather than letting God's word change and shape their opinions. But I would also say that the danger for us, and I'm getting ahead of myself for just a moment, so I'll drop this seed now, is this. So often as Christians, we use the scripture to support our opinions when God's word was meant to shape our opinions. So when I only know a scripture that, oh, I know the scripture, and that scripture, I can use it and I can throw at it, those scriptures become stones that we throw at others. But God's word was meant for so much more. Are you ready to find out how and why? Great. I'm only going to skim the surface today, but we're going to go. And the first thing I'm going to do is this, tell you is this. God's word cleanses, and sh- cleanses our thinking and it cleanses our acting. When I was a child, uh, one of the first scriptures that I, was, that I memorized, my dad, I should back up. Let me back up and give you a little history. I think some of these people know this is this. Uh, I grew up, I'm a pastor's kid. For those of you who didn't know it, maybe online you didn't know this. And, and, uh, and, and from a young child, from about five years old, all the way up and through until I left the house, my dad made us memorize scripture. Um, And so I had so much scripture put in me, but it was useless to me because it was forced on me. There was no relationship. I didn't have relationship with God until I came to the Lord about 19 years old. Yes, I was a pastor's kid who didn't know Jesus until I was 19. I knew everything about theology and religion, more than so many pastors I knew, but I didn't know Jesus. But when I met Jesus, when he became real, when I said, Jesus, you win, I'll follow you for the rest of your life, all of a sudden I found this new love. And people tell you, I tell people, if you want to get me talking, get me talking about my garden, get me talking about food, or get me talking about scripture. Right? Why? Because all of a sudden when I began to know the heart of Jesus, All of a sudden, these scriptures that I'd memorized my whole life, I suddenly understood why my dad made me memorize them. To me, it was just a chore, but all of a sudden, they came alive. And one of the first ones he taught was Psalm 119.11. And Psalm 119.11 says this, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the first thing I want you to know is this. When we begin to read God's word... For a letter from him, for, 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 for his thoughts towards us, and not just rules to follow. When I begin to read it, it begins to change who I am. And how many times do we spend so much energy fighting with sin and not actually reading the word? We don't read the word because we don't feel worthy enough. I can't read the Bible. I feel like such a lousy hypocrite for reading the Bible. So I'm just going to wail and moan about my sin or try to find somebody to hold me accountable. Hey, can somebody tell me I'm okay that I did something wrong? Yes, that's important. Accountability is good. But if the enemy can keep you from going to God's word, then you will not understand how his word was meant to cleanse your thinking. So we'll fill our minds with everything but God's word and wonder why everything but God's word comes out of us in moments of pressure. Psalm 119, 11 says, Your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. How interesting is it that it's the things that I do in secret, the things that I hide in secret come out in public. I love this story There's uh, because so many times I'm like, but, but Pastor Mike, I have read so much of the scripture. I read it, I read it. It doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, there's a story, and I've probably told it a few times before, but I'm going to read it for you because uh, I think it's pertinent. It says, an old farmer lived, in a remote li- lived a remote life in the mountains with his young grandson. Each morning, Grandpa rose early to sit at the kitchen table and read his Bible. His grandson was definitely wanted to copy him and tried to imitate him every way he could. 
One day, the grandson asked, Grandpa, I try to read the Bible just like you, but I don't understand it. And what I do understand, I forget as soon as I close it. What good does the reading the Bible do? The grandfather quietly turned from stoking the coal in his stove, and he replied, Here, take this empty coal basket down to the stream and bring me back a basket of water. The loving boy did as he was told, but all the water leaked out before he returned to the cottage. The grandfather laughed, sending him back to the river and said, You'll have to move a little faster next time. This time the little boy ran quick, but again the basket was empty before he reached home. Out of breath, he told his grandfather that it was impossible to carry water in a basket, and so off he went to fetch a bucket. The loving grandfather replied, I don't want a bucket of water. I want a basket of water. You're just not trying hard enough. He then stepped through the front door to watch his grandson again. At this point, the boy knew the task's impossibility, but he wanted to show his grandfather that even if he ran as fast as he could, the water would leak out before he arrived back. The boy again dipped the basket into the stream and ran as hard as he could, but when he reached his grandfather, the basket was empty. Breathlessly, he said, See? It's useless. The grandfather lovingly looked at him and said, So you think it's useless? Look into the basket. The boy looked into the basket, and for the first time he realized now it was very different. The basket had been transformed from a dirty old coal receptacle into a clean, fresh basket, inside and out, ready for any type of new tasks that it could be used for, that it couldn't have been used for, dirty with coal. Son, he said, that's what happens when you read the Bible. You might not understand and remember everything, but when you read it, you will be changed inside and out. You know, it's a simple story, and I know it's not like, you know, uh, uh, where, okay, so where in history, who is the guy? It doesn't really matter. The point is the same. So often we will read all kinds of self-help books. But you know what the problem with a self-help book is? Sin can't be changed by anything you do by yourself. It's only God's word. And so sometimes we're busy reading self-help books, even good ones, maybe even ones written by scriptural people who love God and love scripture. And they put all these things in there. And so we're looking to see what others say, how we should improve ourselves. But when we just get into God's word and we begin to let it wash through our minds, all of a sudden it begins to process out of us the things that we need to be getting rid of. God's word cleanses us. Next thing God's word does is God's word reveals truth in us. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him for whom we must give account. The Bible was not meant to support our opinions, but rather, reading the Bible is what shapes our opinions. We are in a time in society where culture is polarizing at a rapid rate. I don't need to give you examples. Everyone could come up with a dozen, from politics to culture to race to sports. I mean, just, just get in a conversation with, you know, what, a Dallas fan and an Eagles fan, or a, a, a Red Sox fan and a baseball and a, and a Yankees fan, right? That's simple, silly stuff, right? Anybody ever see, like, you know, uh, people on social media, they'll, go, they'll put up a picture and go, this is a stick, argue with me, Right? And people will do it. It's not a stick, it's a twig, it's a branch, it's wood, it's, right? Because something in us, there's something in the human nature that we have our opinions and golly, we're going to stick to our opinions and we're going to make you believe the way I think. But here's the problem. I have found times in my life when I was so absolutely sure of my opinion that I forcefully advocated for it only to find out later that that opinion in that moment was irrelevant to what was going on in the situation. 
And so while I was so busy enforcing and, 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 and standing up for my opinion about a certain thing, I was missing what God was trying to do in the heart of somebody broken in front of me. And the enemy allowed division over opinion to come in. God's word, what does it say in Hebrews there? It says his word there, it's like a double-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. You know what? We're so busy judging the attitudes and intents of other people's heart because we have not allowed God's word to process our own attitudes and intents. And God is calling us to begin going back to his word. And by the way, it's not just reading scripture. It's not just seeing the text on the page just saying, God, as I'm reading, would you reveal yourself to me in what I'm reading? See, I like how it says it's like a two-edged sword. So what you have to understand is this. The two-edged sword, if you go into the Greek, and there's actually a Greek word for what that sword is, right? So there was a, a word for, and it was a Roman dagger. It was, it was a short sword that, that a Roman centurion or a Roman soldier would have used for close-in combat. It was not the big broad swords. It was, it was when, when the going got tough and it got down and gritty, they pulled it down. That was the weapon of last resort. It was the one that was sharpest. It was the one that was going to do the most damage, and it was going to cut both ways. And the reality of it is that we so often will use God's word to cut others when it was meant to reveal our own hearts to us, not others, because only God can do that. The Bible says that no one knows the depth of the heart except God himself. And so when I begin to read God's word, it begins to process me. And the more I understand that God loves me, the more it begins to change me. Why? Well, the Bible, if, if I'm using the Bible to fix others without letting it first fix me, I become the sword. If I, I'm going to say it again, if I use God's word to judge others without letting it first judge me, I become the sword that cuts others up. See, if I just took one scripture right now, and I said over in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44, 44, 45, love your enemies. If I just stop there, people are already going to be like, uh. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. Pray for those who persecute you. You know what he said? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, pray that I would send my judgment on them. He doesn't say, pray that God will send a legion of angels. Jesus had every opportunity and every right to call down a legion of angels. And when his disciples were like, hey, the soldiers are coming, why don't you call down a legion of angels? Jesus goes, that's not my way. And as I have done for you, so you do for one another. And so when I begin to recognize God's word, and all of a sudden I look at not everybody in front of me is my enemy. Matter of fact, the people in front of me are not my enemy. They may be used by the enemy, but God still created them with purpose and plan. And it's my job and my responsibility when I understand him. I can't change anyone, but he can change anyone through me. But not if I'm carrying the sword. <laughs> so I've got to let the word reveal, God, what's going on in my heart? But it doesn't happen if you don't open it up and begin to let it process. Cleansing your thinking, cleansing your mind, right? You know, I, I have found so often that it's in these moments where I begin to have very uh, definite opinions. I had a conversation with Bishop and Pastor Marco, and I was adamant about a position, enough so that Bishop had to come back to me a second day and go, hey, you know, I was really thinking what you are thinking. Are you really as adamant about it? I said, yes. And you know now, four days removed from that, I meant to send him a text this morning, so Bishop, if you're watching online, I see what you're saying. Sometimes we get so defined about what's right and wrong, and it doesn't mean that I look at somebody and go, oh, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Some things are wrong and they're evil, but the wrong and the evil that someone does does not make them wrong or evil. It makes them deceived by the enemy, and God wants to use us to bring life and love and truth, but if I'm so busy judging them, then I can't be busy giving them an example of God's grace like Jesus did for me, and I will tell you, and my wife will agree, I need lots of grace. Third thing that it does, God's word provides direction for life, 
But here's the interesting thing. It requires action, not just ingestion. God's word requires action, not just ingestion. Uh, I got some pictures back there. Can you get those up on the board for me? Is it possible to get those out for me? Uh, Choose whichever one you want first. Oh, they're on the side. I'm looking in the back. Oh, hey, what is that? Okay, what's the next picture? Ooh, what is that? You're both wrong. You're wrong on both accounts. So I'll let you try again. What are those? First of all, which, well, we'll stick with one. Which do you want? Do you want? Do you want the first picture or the second picture? Second picture. Okay, we're leaving this one up. Okay, so this is one. So what is that? What is it? Whoa, I think somebody said it. No, no, no. No, nah, y'all. Y'all. Is that steak? Really? You can eat that? I will give someone a hundred bucks if they can get up on a stepladder and eat that. What is that? It's a picture of steak. It is a picture of steak. It was a picture of pizza. Can you smell the pizza? Can you smell the steak? If you lick the screen, would it taste lovely like chimichurri? No, and Pastor Manny would be really upset if somehow you figured out how to do that. But the problem is, that's how we look at the Bible. We let somebody tell us about Scripture, and then we go, oh yeah, I love God's Word. But you never once opened it for yourself. You let somebody just talk about it. James 1, 23 through 25 says this, Anyone who merely listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their own face in the mirror and after looking at themselves goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. When we read God's word, it begins to purify our thinking. It reveals our motives. It helps us begin to understand what it means to be a righteous person. And it results in a fulfilling direction for life. God is calling us to open his word because when we begin to do this, and not just reading words on a page, but saying, God, would you help me understand? And being patient and doing it repeatedly, and constantly. What do he say? And staring intently into the law that brings life. Intently. How many of us intently stare? See, that's the problem with the devotional life. We stare intently at the devotional, find the scripture reference, go back to the devotional, find the scripture reference, go back to the devotional, and then wonder why when we're all done, we've gotten our check for the day, but it hasn't moved the needle in our lives. God is saying to all of us, there are times coming. Let me not get ahead of myself. We need to begin looking into the law of God, which changes things. Let me give you a freebie. Let me give you a freebie. One of my favorite scriptures in life, and if you've been in a scriptural advisement session with me, chances are you may have heard this. But it's found in Psalm 37, 23 and 24. It says, The steps of a good man, other versions are righteous or blessed man, are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Antonio, would you give me a hand up here? Move, move, move. Yep, come on. Don't be shy. Okay, so we're going to break down a scripture. We're going to take, come on, I need you up here, Ben. They, they, I, I, they need to see this handsome guy. There we go. All right. Woohoo! That was a man. Not a, don't worry, you're safe. Then again, I'm going to, we'll just leave it alone. All right, I'm going to read the scripture again. I'll read the scripture again. 
The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So we're going to walk through what this means. First of all, the first question for you is this. What comes first? The man's steps or God ordering the man's steps? Okay, so the steps of a righteous man are to order the Lord and he delights in his way. The steps of the righteous man are ordered to the Lord and he delights in his way. What comes first? God ordering the steps and delighting him and the man taking the steps. All of you who say the man takes steps first, raise your hand. All of you who say God orders them first, raise your hand. Okay, so here's why reading the Bible is important. Lesson and observation. The steps of a good man or a righteous man are then ordered by the Lord, and then he delights in his way. Now, I'm going to ask the question, what comes first? The righteous man's steps or God's ordering of his steps? The steps come first, but what's the problem that we have so often with taking steps for God? We're afraid of the outcome. We don't know where it's going to go, or I don't know what step I should take. God, how can I, I can't, God, can't you just come down and tell me what step, where I should go and what to do? And that's how we live our lives. We want a prophetic word that tells us where we end up before we've taken a first step anywhere. But scripture says it's the steps of a righteous man that are order of the Lord. The righteous man is what? Is that a perfect person? Are you perfect? Your wife said so. Okay. So she lies? Oh, okay. We'll do more counseling afterwards. The steps of a righteous man. So a righteous man, what would you define a righteous man was? Say it loud so we can kind of, and I'll, I'll repeat it. What do you think a righteous man is? Your, your words. Somebody who is obedient to God. Okay. Are you always obedient to God? No, neither am I. So that can't be it. It's part of it, but can't be it. Simplest definition. What do you think? Oh, I, I like some of these guys justified by Jesus and right standing. Here, let me make it simple for you. Somebody who desires to put God first in every single thing that they do. Recognizing that there is no one righteous, but God makes us righteous. And if our heart is inclined towards him, then we have that. But now I'm in a position where I have to start making decisions about what I'm going to do in life and how to go. And that's where things get nervous. And so sometimes what I have to do is I just have to make decisions. But I want you to see this word picture now. Because I love you. You're, he's a big baby. No, no, he's really going to be a big baby right now. You're a big baby right now. You're a big baby. You can be a big baby. Good, you can be a big baby. So I have two girls. 17 and almost 14, I remember they were their babies, and I remember when they first started to walk, and I remember what it looked like, and so do you remember what it looked like for your kids to start to walk for the first time? Okay, turn face me a little bit. Okay, so, takes the first step. How did a baby take a first step? What does it look like? <laughs> oh, very good, very good, right? Okay, stop, there we go. Everybody agree, that's kind of what it looks like, right? <laughs> Steps of a baby. Okay. So there's baby steps going on. So where is, where, where, where is Antonio, baby Antonio walking towards? Yeah, why? Because what? Because he probably trusts me, probably wants to follow me, and wants to go where I'm going. So notice something? Guess which direction he's going. Come on. And what's my posture? I'm right here, right? Okay, stop right there. You ever remember seeing a baby take a first steps? What was, your, what was your thought when they took those first steps? I went ballistic. Yes, you can do it. Come on, you're doing great. Take another one. Good, take another one. That's it, that's it. Stumble a little bit. Hey, it's okay, I got you. You're good, you're good. Keep another step. And they start coming to me. Now watch this. All right, you watch this. You, you, you coming? Okay. Very good. Very good job. Good job. Wait a minute, stop. Am I going in a straight line? I'm backing up, but what is he doing? Still taking steps. Why? He's following because that's where his eyes are. He's keeping his eyes on me. But what's my posture? Right here. Because you know what I know? I know he's going to stumble. And when he stumbles, I'm going to be right there to catch him. Now watch what happens when you have selfish baby who wants to go their own direction. You go whatever way you want. And stumble. I'm over here. Now listen, 
baby decides they've fallen and they cry because they've fallen, do I go, huh, stinks to be you? What does a father do? A father comes and says, are we ready to try this again? You're good. Thank you. Okay. Why am I doing this? Why am I bringing this up? Because I want a couple of things to happen. First of all, I want you to see how God's word works. When you begin to open up and you begin to read past the surface understanding of it and you begin to look for the details of what he's saying, suddenly the revelation of his scripture pops out and it begins to change your faith. And now something that you guys may have never heard before, you've now heard and guess what you get to do with it? Process it in your own life and pass it on to someone else. Why? Because for somebody here, that just changed your mindset. It was more than just an interesting observation. It may have changed your life. But for all of us, it becomes one more reminder of the author of this book and how much he cares about you and how much he cares about me. And he knows when you can't come into church because you're ashamed. He knows when you can't come to church because you're homesick. He's still right there with you. And walking correctly doesn't necessarily mean you're making every church service because you could come into this service and I'm sure there's probably people here who come week after week whose hearts have not even yet been changed, but God still is reaching out for you. But I want to tell you something for all of us. God's word was meant to be read in secret to be shared in community. Because so often we're wanting God, God, would you just speak to me? God, would you speak to me? God, would you speak to me? And he goes, hey, I've been sending, I've been sending An- Antonio to you, knocking on your door, but you don't have time to talk to him. God will use his body, our family, to share and to encourage one another. And we become his voice to one another. But if I think I can just stay at home and read the scripture and that's going to do it, no, it's not. It's the starting place. But what we do in private, we bring into community. And now together, we all grow in maturity. And that's what we're called to. As I bring this to a close, I want to circle back because you notice I didn't say anything about the scripture I opened up with. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul makes a few things clear. Number one, he makes it clear that persecution is something he's experienced. Suffering is something that he's experienced. And then he says this, and so are you. Because it's part of the condition of a fallen world. But in no place in his scripture does he ever find himself hopeless. Because he says, I have a truth. And Timothy, I am convinced that it's in you because you have become convinced of the same things because you have trusted those who have taught it to you and you have put it into practice. It's interesting, when Paul says this, like, okay, well, who was it? Over in, uh, in a different verse, it says this, that uh, T- Timothy's, uh, Paul's talking to Timothy and he says this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is living in you as well. Listen, the first thing we have to understand is this, you do not exist as a Christian alone. We exist as family. And we need to be family that knows how to rightly use Scripture to build one another up in such ways that we pass a legacy down from one generation to the next. So we can either pass down opinions about Scripture that change no one's heart but bring more polarization and division, or we can get into Scripture and say, God, would you change me so that the character that you have placed in me is what get passed down so that my kids have a hunger to figure out where it came from. First Peter 3.15, Peter says this, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord and always be ready to give answer for the hope that you have, but do so, or the joy that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. Peter was talking to the church when they were in the middle of being persecuted like you would not believe. And he said, set apart Christ as Lord in the middle of the persecution. You will find joy and those persecuting you will look at you and go, what in the world is your deal? And your answer will be, not because you have the right politics, 
Not because you have the right practice, but because you have Jesus Christ as your Lord. Jesus said this, even when he left his disciples after the crucifixion or right before the crucifixion, he says, I'm going to be gone. Because I'm not going to leave you abandoned. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit who will lead you and guide you in all things and bring to remembrance those things which I've taught you. Here's what I want you to understand. When you begin to open God's word and you begin to ingest it, you give something for his Holy Spirit to bring back to your remembrance when you need it. We need the author in our hearts and we need his word cleansing our minds and directing who we are. Listen, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about this. We'll talk about some hows and some skill sets. I'm honored and privileged on October 16th to be starting a class on Wednesday nights about how to study the Bible. And we'll talk about techniques. We'll talk about the histories of the Bible, the makeups of the Bible, and all of that. And that's a wonderful thing. But I'm going to encourage you, don't wait till October 16th to take a class. When you leave this place, purpose to start. And purpose to move past, I don't understand. If you do nothing else, do this. If you've never read the Bible before, start in the book of John. And every day, read a chapter of John. 21 days, you'll get through. You know what's interesting they say? It takes 21 days to set a habit. Read the book of John. And when you're done with it, if you want, go back and reread it. Or move to another one. Contact me. I can give you some suggestions. But let me challenge you, if you've been a believer for any period of time, and you say, you know, I'm, I like the Bible, I've read the Bible, but you've never read the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelations, start now. I do have a metric I can give you about how long it takes doing 10 minutes a day. Basically, you should be able to do it in one year, reading 10 minutes a day. Make it a habit. Why? Not to check a box, but so that God can check your heart. Can you receive that today? Thank you so much. God bless you, Pastor Marco. Give it up for Pastor Mike. An incredible word. I'm excited for the weeks ahead as we learn more about how to study the Bible. Amen? Amen. Like I said earlier in the service, I'm going to take up a second offering for our summer camp. If you need an envelope, you can raise your hands. They're going to put a QR code on the screen, hopefully. But you can give online also. Now, some of you are like, wasn't summer camp like in July? You know, that is a true story. Normally on summer camp Sunday, we take up a second offering to cover expenses. And we didn't take one that day. And now that we are fully past summer camp, all of it is done, we realized one th couple things with summer camp. It is a life-changing event for our young people for the last two decades that we don't ever want to stop doing. And the fruit it bears in our homes, in their lives, in this church, in their schools, we cannot even measure. We thank you and we continue to thank those that trust us with their kids, that give and sponsor our kids, to the volunteers that take off from work and pay to go to summer camp. Amazing. And the other thing we learned is that we have not charged adequately to cover summer camp for years. From before the pandemic, we have been trying to keep it as low as possible. And one thing we just found out is that this year to send our kids to and anybody to summer camp, it costs us $600. So you can do the math. We charged $450, $475. So that difference ended up resulting to depending on if people that say they're going to still pay comes in anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars we came up short it's a lot of money what i love because if you've been here for a minute or for a year or for back in the, you know from bishop all the way down we want to be great stewards with our finances We've always taught this. This is what we operate in to make sure we are good stewards. 
So when Pastor Sandy and I found out how short this was, we were a little nervous. We were like, we might be doing summer camp in the gym next year because <laughs> this wasn't necessarily a great stewardship. And why am I telling you this? One is as parents and as a church, for next year, we are going to have to charge a little more. That's understandable. I mean, you charge more for your rent, for your gas, for your groceries, you know, your lights, everything. And we've been trying to hold off almost to a fault that we've just experienced. So next year, but what we're going to do, we want to give that heads up. Parents, start planning now for next year. I'm being serious. Start planning so there's, we do not have our kids stay back. And then the other thing is, when it comes to this is that with our summer camp that we're going to do more fundraising next year so instead of charging 600 we can charge less right for everybody okay so that's some of our goals as bishop was like no let's get some solutions and let's still do it next year. So that is our goal. We're so thankful for the church and the heart and what we're going to. So we're going to meet the church as a whole. The, the, um, every penny will get paid this year for camp and get covered because we see how great the ministry is. But today, the one thing we want to do is any of you have the opportunity and the ability to sow into this past camp to help offset the price we would appreciate it greatly. If not, continue praying as we plan for next year and do the fundraising. Amen? Amen. If you need an envelope, raise your hands. As we give this morning, this is what I'm going to do if you are a teenager in this room, and you, a lot of them are downstairs, a lot of them are come on Wednesdays and might not even come to church on a Sunday morning, but if you went to summer camp, stand up. Because as we pray, we're going to pray over you and pray over the future of our camp and praying over this offering. Look at these, look at these incredible young people. Jonathan, come up here real quick, real quick, run. Yes, you're the Jonathan, run. That's not running. Run. You're young. You're not like Antonio. Come up here. <laughs> Come up here. I know. I'm messing, I'm messing around. I'm messing. Great job, anyway. Pray over this offering. Oh, I got you. <laughs> Father God, I just want to just wanna thank you for today, for this service, Lord. I just ask you just to protect us. And just thank you for the word, honestly, um, really spoke to my life. But just protect, protect us after this service. Come for us and let us know who you really are for the people who really need you right now. Just show them your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pray for the offering. Oh, the, oh, what's the, the offering for summer camp. Hey, oh, ready? I got you. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Let's wait. Have... Have you been sponsored to go to camp? You have. How many times? Once. Amen. And how, how did it change your life? Did it change your life? Yeah. I'm not putting pressure on you. You like, you want to go into full-time ministry. You want to start Alpha at your college that you st just started and all these amazing things. Am I right? So summer camp is a part of that, right? As well as Tita and the Rosiello family and the youth ministry. So pray over this offering for the seed of how it's going to bless and how it did bless others just like you. Okay. All right, let's do it. I'm back, God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, the, I just want to say the way, the way you worked in my life, the way I didn't think I would go to summer camp, but you found a way, Lord. And that you really spoke to me in that, in that place. That I was called to do something. So God, I just pray for people who just have doubt to, to thinking that they're not gonna go to summer camp. But you have a calling in their life that they don't even know. That once they go in that place, there's gonna be miracles that's gonna happen in their life. 
and there's going to be a calling that they're going to come out and they're going to come after. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be confusing at first, but it's going to be worth it at the end. So, Father, I just pray just for, like, just for support, just for no doubt, just peace, and that you will bless them in their life. And, yeah, in Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Ushers, you may serve the people. Teenagers, you can sit down. We're not dismissing you. We'll dismiss as soon as the offering is over. And that, that word was so good. I don't want to come and preach next week. So I'm hoping Lauren gives birth on Saturday night so that Pastor Mike can just come back up and, and preach part two. But here's seriously what I want to encourage you. And I was supposed to give this announcement about the, the, um, the, prayer, the Bible course that's coming up in the middle of service, and I totally forgot. And then I was like, ooh, afterwards, and Pastor Mike mentioned it. So now you got a taste. We believe that the Word of God can be unlocked in all of our lives. But we have to learn. So we want to encourage all of you that are not at youth ministry to be part of our How to Study the Bible. It's going to start on October 16th. If you can put the screen on, there it is. You can register now. Okay? We're going to have this eight-week course. Pastor Mike is going to lead it with others and it is going to be filled just the same way we did the evangelism course. We did the prayer course. Those that when we do Alpha, set up in the same way. Because here's the deal. A lot of us have gone through Alpha. A lot of us are in this church, new believers with Alpha. And we're like, what's next? These courses we're developing are part of the what's next. That prayer course was part of the what's next. And we'll be bringing that back in January. The evangelism course is part of that what's next. On how to mature and grow in our faith. This how to study the Bible is part of the what's next. And we'll be doing even more of these courses next year as we grow. Of how do we disciple and grow and mature. And this is a vital part of it. I want to encourage you. Make the time make the sacrifice, sign up today. Spots are going to become scarce, so you do not want to miss out. So sign up today for this course, and make sure you come back next week as we continue to learn about the Holy Bible. Amen? Stand on up. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this house we thank you for this church. We thank you for your kingdom that we are part of not just a small group of people that gather on Sunday morning in Milford, Connecticut and watch online, <coughs> but that we are part of your global church and you are moving on the earth through your spirit, through your word, through the prayers of our grandmothers and aunties and daddies and uncles and teachers. And that, Lord God, you are doing something so special today that all of us are part of, young and old, new to the Lord and seasoned saints. We're rolling up our sleeves together. We're eating dinner at the table together. And we thank you for what you're doing and that we get to be part of this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful day.